Good afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today is uh, Thursday, October 10th, 2013. Clerk, if you call the roll, please. Councilor Graney? Here. Councilor Camardo? Here. Councilor Smith? Here. Councilor Zika? Here. Mayor Quill? Here. Before we stand for a Pledge of Allegiance, we have some scouts with us from Troop 11 from the Auburn Alliance Church. I would ask them if they would come to the rail and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll talk a little bit about them as to what they're doing here this evening. So, scouts, if you would, please. If you all please stand. of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you remain standing for a moment of silent prayer or reflection, the scouts, if you turn around and face the camera, because your families will be dying to get a picture of you on TV, so. Thank you, please be seated. As I mentioned, these are these gentlemen are from Troop 11, Auburn from Auburn Alliance Church. They're attending a city council meeting in order to pursue the communications merit badge. Required to work on attend a public meeting, city council, school board, or a debate approved by their council where several points of view are given on a single issue. You will certainly find that here this evening or any evening. Practice, practice active listening skills and take careful notes of each point of view and present an objective report that includes all points of view that were expressed and share this with your counselor. So thank you for being here with us today and to your parents and your guardians and your leaders for leading you in the right direction. So thank you. Behind you there are two gentlemen with uh, dark blue shirts and t-shirts, very short hair. <laughs> They are marine recruiters, so they're here on a mission today. They're looking for some young, good, some good young men and women. So, watch out if they ask you to sign anything, don't. All right, <laughs> or sign someone else's name. All right. <laughs> we will move along to our public to be heard. And clerk, if you would read our rules and regulations. At this time, we'll, we'll, we will open the public to be heard portion of our council meeting. As a reminder, and pursuant to city council rules of procedure, prior to addressing council, speakers are asked to state their name, address, and affiliation, if any. All comments should be addressed to the entire council and not to individual staff members. Your remarks should be limited to three minutes and concern only issues involving the city council, city government, or matters of general city concern. And all speakers before council should observe commonly accepted rules of courtesy, personal attacks, or abusive language will be ruled out of order. Thank you. At this time, is there anyone desiring to be heard? Mr. Arnold, first, please, then. Uh, my name is Dave Arnold, 29 Logan Street. I'm the president of the Q County Labor Council. Uh, 2 15 this afternoon, I received a uh, communication from Richard Knowles. Uh, business rep for the United Steel Workers. As of that time, and it has been released to the media, Dykin will be here until December of 2015. Now that does give us a slight window, but also realize that what is needed is a positive attitude. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoffman, please. Good evening, my name is Justin Huffman from the Camardo Law Firm, 127 Genesee Street. Uh, I'm here to talk about the theater project. Um, I, first, I'd like to pass out a letter along with some documentation. Four of them, please, if you have them. Yeah. Uh, this evening, I've brought with me Mr. Jim Napoleon, owner of Jim Napoleon and Associates, who will speak regarding the various issues regarding State Street, along with Ms. Nicole Copeland of Certified Environmental Services, who will speak regarding the city's constant refusal to conduct soil and groundwater testing. I've spoken here with respect to these issues repeatedly over the last several months. I just passed out to you 
copies of a New York State Supreme Court decision where a negative declaration was overturned for the failure to take a hard look because the lead agency did not know the cause and extent of contamination. I would like to direct your attention to page 33 of that case, which specifically states that the number one reason that it was overturned was not knowing the cause and extent of the contamination. Our concerns have continuously been ignored here, but there's still time for you all to rescind the condition negative declaration and require that things be done correctly, or it's likely that we will be right back in court once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. I'm afraid I also have something to hand out to the board. <laughs> Keep me busy. Yeah. You want I me can, to do it? Or I can hand out for you. Go ahead. Bring some over. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Did you save one for yourself? Did you save one for yourself? I'm also we have one. We have Thank you. you. <clears throat> and we'd ask you to start out with your name and address, please. Yes, sir. My name is James Napoleon. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of New York in New Jersey. Um, my address is in Syracuse, New York. Um, I've been retained by Mr. Camardo to uh, re review the application that, it, that uh, exists for the proposed theater. Um, in particular, I would like to point out the fact that State Street is now in violation of, the, of state fire codes, and it will be, uh, that, that violation will be exacerbated by the fact that there will be an additional 300 plus number of people at the proposed theater. Um, the street at its maximum is, 20, is 31 feet wide, the fire code requires that 26 feet be kept unobstructed for the purpose of fire control. Um, in other words, allowing fire uh, apparatus and firemen to uh, address whatever the emergency, emergency happens to be. That means that there's only five feet left on the street. That means you cannot have parking on the street. And in my estimation, in my professional opinion, you cannot even have drop-offs in front of the theater, specifically because the drop-offs may be occurring at the time that a, a fire engine has to uh, have access to the site, and that vehicle would be an obstruction, prohibiting the use of the, uh, the proper use and uh, adequate use of the fire equipment. There are a number of other issues that are brought up in my letter uh, letter report, if you will, uh, concerning the problems that I see with the, uh, the proposal. Um, I'll, I would like to mention, however, that uh, there are a number of articles of the state fire code that are in violation. They are no, Article 503.2, 503.2.1, 503.2.2, 503.2.2, 503.2.2, 105.2. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello, I also have some handouts. <laughs> There's just two letters. For two letters. Everybody? Gotcha. Yeah, pop quiz, right? <laughs> You're doing your classroom? Matt, is there going to be a test? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They're not mimeographed. You can't smell them. Okay. 
Um, yep, my name is Nicole Copeland. I work for Certified Environmental Services. I was retained by the Camarder Law Firm to review various environmental documentations regarding the um, project. Um, the address of my company is 7280 Caswell Street in North Syracuse, New York. Um, without rehashing the whole history of you know what's been contained in these letters and going into all the details, which I'm sure you're pretty familiar with, um, the purpose of talking here today was just to kind of let you know why we are very perplexed at the reluctance of the developers and the owners to test the soil regarding this project um, prior to, you know, as part of the CEQRA process. Um, the whole point of, the whole purpose of CEQRA is to identify potential environmental concerns with a project and it does seem that they did look pretty hard, but for some reason the testing of the soil seems to be one step of the process that has not been completed. Um, you know, there's supposed to be about 2,000 tons of soil removed as part of the project um, without any testing of the soil. There's no way of knowing whether or not that soil is going to be handled properly, whether there's contamination, could be anything related to volatiles, semi-volatiles, heavy metals, um, and to not know the condition of those soils prior to the beginning of this project just seems a little concerning, especially given the cost of doing such testing would probably be five to ten thousand dollars. Would be a relatively simple step, part of the due diligence that we feel is responsible by the developers or the owners to do prior to the beginning of the project. And um, I think that's about it. <laughs> And I guess we would request, I guess, if we wanted to do a break at this point, if anybody had any questions or a conversation we'd like to have. I'm sorry, but due to our rules and regulations, you're allowed to say what's on your mind. Okay. We're not allowed to get engage in a debate at this Sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. My name is Kevin Leonard, <clears throat> and at the moment I am residing at 19 McMaster Street. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, I want to thank, um, uh, <laughs> I want to thank the mayor. Uh, I would like to thank, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the fire chief, Jeff Digert, and County Legislature uh, of the 13th District, Tim Lattimore, for his advocating for me when I was homeless. These wonderful men saw to it that I received shelter when I had none. I am an honorably discharged United States Marine Corps veteran who recently fell upon hard times. I wish to thank again their unselfish efforts with securing me uh, housing. In addition, I, I got to know Mr. Lattimore, uh, and I'd like to just say something about his upcoming election. Much like his dad, Paul Sr., Mr. Tim Lattimore has a vision for his constituents. Running once again for county legislator, 13th District, this man is one of the most dedicated civil servants I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Timothy, being the former mayor of Auburn, has shown the type of leadership it takes to get the job done. Mr. Lattimore was instrumental in keeping Snyder General <clears throat> in Auburn for an additional 20 years, and, and apparently I found out uh, plus one th uh, being this year. He's a champion of veterans' rights and is not afraid to speak his mind to those in authority who turned a cold shoulder to, shoulders, to soldiers in need. I can attest to this because I was a lost, homeless, hopeless vet these past four months, and Mr. Lattimore stepped in to advocate for me. Also, Timothy was not in favor of the Cuga County Nursing Home merging with Mercy Rehab. I have wholeheartedly have to agree with this because I had the pleasure of serving the nursing home for these past three years. Unfortunately, the powers that be sold our wonderful nursing home, and our residents will be incorporated into Mercy Rehab on St. Anthony Street. 
I truly believe having Mr. Lattimore as our future county legislator of the 13th district will be a godsend to us all. Sincerely, Kevin J. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Semper Fi. Is there anyone else desiring to be heard this evening? Mr. Davis, please. Yes, Norm Davis, Neighborhood Housing Commission, and I don't have any handouts, so you can take a break. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank the mayor and city council for adding the uh, road into the nuisance law that was passed last week at city council. It's really don't put an injection as far as my job is concerned. I've gotten a few calls stating they didn't know about it until I acquainted them with them. They had heard rumors about it, and I told them that it was true, and it's really don't help them as far as the houses that are around them, uh, these rodents and everything will always come around. So again, on, on behalf of myself and the commission, thank you all very much. Thank you. Anyone else desiring to be heard? No one else will close the portion of the meeting and we will move along to the approval of the meeting minutes from September 19th, 2013. We have a sponsor, Councilor Camardo, second by Councilor Rizica. Discussion? <coughs> If you'd call the roll, please. Councilor Graney? Yes. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Smith? Aye. Councilor Zika? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. Carried. Presentations and proclamations? None. Public announcements? I have none. City manager's report? Uh, I just have one item, uh, Mayor and Councilors. It's kind of a reminder. Uh, we created a, or the council created a business promotion committee and a parking advisory committee and we're still short a few members so uh, if you could send those names to either myself or john rossi we'll try to get those boards populated and get them meeting and focused on the tasks that you identified for them uh, that that's all i have thank you public announcements none it's, uh, I already did that, repeating myself. <laughs> Presentation, nothing. petition, nothing? Nothing until other business. Seekers, ordinances, resolution, local law, table legislation, other, other business. Mr. Talbot. I've put some handouts. There's a few. There are some handouts. I believe they're on this first bench if for, anyone's looking for them. For so the, um, the landfill. For the landfill presentation. It's the other one. The landfill is the one. You'll need both, but. Like your first presentation is going to be in regards to KC Park? Yes. Oh, sorry. We don't have anything on that, right, Mike? Uh, no, because really it's more of a show and tell. Okay. Uh, there's really, this is more just to keep everybody informed because unfortunately probably everybody doesn't see how the pool is filtered and how we make ice and uh, just some of the things that probably some of the maintenance issues we have upcoming. So I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, the history down at Casey Park, it was donated by the Casey family back at the turn of the century and it's had various uses through through the years. Uh, our current facility was developed in the, in the early 70s and it still includes to this day basketball courts, tennis courts, walking trail, playground, picnic shelters, skateboard park, softball fields, horseshoe pits. And we have one of the few 50 meter swimming pools that are outdoors, it's Olympic size. Uh, we have the ice rink, we have a soccer field and it, it, and it encompasses approximately 45 acres. So it's nice, nice uh, usable green space. Uh, the building itself is just a simple one floor masonry block construction, pretty carefree as far as that goes. And the main building, what we call the lobby usually, includes two offices, it has the lobby, has public restrooms, two locker rooms, a concession stand, two smaller coaches offices in the back and they, they each have showers and lockers and what we call the compressor room, which is we'll see pictures of that. Uh, the rink dimensions are 200 by 85. It's considered an NHL size rink. It's not an international size rink, so it's pretty standard for the United States. Uh, it has a press box out there, two smaller locker rooms out in the rink itself, 
and we have uh, the ice resurfacer room with our melting pit if you have to use it. And the ice resurface, what everyone probably more commonly knows is the Zamboni, which is a brand name, but actually it's, a, it's classified as an ice resurfacer. Our schedule down there in, in, is uh, we, we maintain ice October through February, and you have uh, activities of hockey and public skating. Uh, the artificial turf is down from March through September, and you have lacrosse, baseball, softball, soccer, and field hockey can be in there. Now getting into the ice making, what we're going to do is cover three things basically. The rink, what we do with it, uh, the pool, what we do with it, and the roof because there, there are some roofing needs there. We, our ice making system, we, cir we circulate glycol and it's a, it, it's a complex system of heat transfer, it's chilling the air, it's recirculating, and it's, and it's all pressure driven. Now part of the process, we all think like, uh, I guess in Batman, Mr. Freeze touches things and they freeze, but this, this also takes the heat out of the concrete that the floor is. So there's a, there's a couple of things going on. We're removing heat from the floor, but we're also dropping the temperature of it. And if we were to go down right now, the ice is set right now at about 19.3 degrees. That's, uh, we're just putting the ice down right now. We open up Sunday for people to skate. Uh, but fortunately, the, the system, the glycol circulated through the piping system, which is underneath the slab. So it's still the original piping. I hope I don't jinx it, but it's, uh, you know, it was installed in the early 70s. We've never had a problem with it. If anyone has seen the slab down there of concrete, definitely wasn't poured on a Monday or a Friday because it's, it's almost immaculate still. So it's really good. Uh, the entire refrigeration system was replaced, including the chillers back in the 90s. And we'll see the whole, uh, what the whole system looks like back there. One of our compressors, we have a two compressor system is uh, redundancy for backup. Uh, one compressor was replaced about two years ago. Uh, preventative maintenance for the compressors consists of rebuilding the upper heads of each compressor approximately every third year. Obviously changing out the fluids and uh, always checking the pressures. Our, our system is kind of becoming obsolete. What they're going to now, if, you, if we were to update our system, what's called the salt brine circulation system, as glycol has some inherent issues with it as far as environmental things, but fortunately we've never had any leaks or anything. Our system is aging and this is why we're, we're doing this tonight, just so we'll, everyone's aware of what uh, some of our needs are gonna be down there. And our system now is not nearly as efficient as the newer system utilizing modern technology, so. This is what, uh, now we get into the pictures, this is the, what we call the compressor room. And what we're looking at, it's kind of dark, I wish it had, had uh, transferred a little better than this, but they, you can see the system of piping and we'll take a picture. This is, that's compressor two you see on the bottom. This is on the side of the control pan. As you can see, there's a lot of gauges, a lot of uh, tubing, a lot of, uh, a lot of numbers. It's a constant recording of numbers that our people have to do every, every other hour to record pressure variations and uh, any drops in pressure, which of course, that's when you have a problem. That's compressor two right there. Once again, this isn't very exciting, but I think it's important that we all know how, how much goes into this. That's the, all those gauges and dials and lights have a, have a meaning. And uh, whenever one of the ones that are red or yellow go off, that's not good. So. That's compressor one right there. And you can see the lockout tag out that valve right there is closed. This, is, this was taken before they were turned on. So uh, and you can see w uh, how we get into there to repair the heads, the upper heads. That's our uh, circulation for some of the water that comes back out of the system. And that in turn on the other side of the wall, which will get another angle of it, is our cooling tower. That's that same view of the compressor room. You can see how, uh, how involved all the, the piping, the insulation, and it does get rather loud in there. That's our cooling tower out and back. That's actually in the, where the pool is and our Freon recovery tank at the bottom. So you can tell when the, when the system comes on because, uh, you know, not unlike a power plant, the water gets circulated out there to transfer the heat to the air. So what, what the glycol comes in, the water gets out. And that's another view. You can see the overhead door. The actual entire system, including the chillers, gets moved in on forks and it's actually on a big skid. 
So that's how uh, the building was designed. That's another angle of the control box. Once again, so if we were to have any problems, which knock on wood, we hopefully don't, but if, if the floor, and how you tell if your floor is leaking, when I say the floor, I mean the pipes beneath the floor, is you'll have some wet spots out in the ice. So, and if we were to replace everything, we'd have to do the both compressors, the brine circulation pumps, the, all the chillers, and the replacement, but that doesn't include the piping. You're talking about $275,000 if we were to replace everything not including the piping, but just in the compressor room. Mike, if you switch to the brine, would the piping in the flooring have to be replaced? No. Okay. But, you know, I think brine would be a little bit more corrosive just because of the nature of it, so there are some issues that we would probably have to, uh, you know, and who knows, maybe with a brine, maybe a sand-based floor would be better than a, than a concrete floor. There's different options out there, but if, you know, hopefully we don't have to address that anytime soon because uh, Ormy who works down there is, you know, the master of keeping them running. So we're good. Now what we're gonna do is jump to our pool system. So any questions on the ice making? It's pretty involved. Uh, it, I'm glad everybody here has the opportunity to see actually all of the mechanics that go involved because if anyone's an aspiring mechanical engineer or a fluids engineer, uh, the ice making system's pretty impressive, so. Now our pool, we have, uh, like I said before, one of the only 50 meter pools that are, that's outdoors in the area. We also have a smaller wading pool. And for the larger pool, we have two high rate sand filters for the main pool. We have a smaller filter for the wading pool. We have pictures of those also. 50 meter pool, range in depth in the shallow end, three feet to 13 feet. Holds approximately 685,000 gallons of water. So it's a large surface area. One of the problems you have during the summer is evaporation if you have an exceptionally clear summer, we have to add water every day to account for the, uh, for the evaporation. The wading pool is 10 inches deep, holds approximately seven, about 18,000 gallons of water. These are the two sand filters. You can see the age, uh, they were replaced in the early 90s, but you can see some of the wear there, some of the rust, and the, the bottoms are, because are, it is a corrosive environment because there is chlorine involved, uh, there are some issues with our, with our filters. They're old and getting tired, though they're still doing the job. That's the pump, so it comes and it pumps it down. We'll, what we call the, it's going to the right there to the pit. That's what we call it. It's not a confined space. It's open, but it is down in the ground. That in turn pumps it out to the, this is just for the 50-meter uh, pool. This doesn't do the small pool. That is a, a terrible picture, but we tried to shine a flashlight down there. That's you're about 12 feet down in what we call the pit which is your valving system. And unfortunately, you can't see, I wish I had a laser or something. You can, there's a wheel right there that you open and close the valves, but that's uh, broken in a couple spots, so it, it's old. Another view of nothing, really, sorry about that, but I tried to shine the light on some of the more interesting parts of it. But that's the sand filter for the wading pool. That looks similar to if anyone has a, a pool in their backyard, this is a little bit more recognizable maybe as a filter. Same principle, filters the uh, water through the sand and pumps it back into the pool. That is our, that's how we get, uh, our, it's actually sodium hypochlorite, it's, uh, that's what we use as our chlorine. It's, uh, we have a thousand gallon above ground storage tank that's registered with the DEC and uh, that's how we pump the chlorine into the water right through uh, our tank. That's the actual, what we call the filter house. Chlorine is there on the left, the door's open. The sand filters you can see for the, for the uh, 50 meter pool are straight ahead. That's another shot of it. That's the wading pool on the left and the uh, big pools on the right if anyone's not familiar with how the logistics of our park. Now, if we were to have to replace everything, and remember it is getting old and we do have some problems with it. Uh, one advantage is now the modern systems, we might be able to get away with just one filter as opposed to two. That's how technology has improved efficiency. Uh, but if we were to replace, we'd have to do the piping, gauges, valves, all that, and about $175,000. So and we did a, uh, um, I know Councilor Graney, you were involved in the liner system for the pool, and that's really worked out well. It really has. Uh, it's, it's a lot more durable, I think, than we thought at first, and we have just minor, minor maintenance to do each year with it. 
Now, my question, did we save anything on the chlorine? Because they said when they would put that membrane in that you would save on chlorine. Well, I can tell you this. We've, our chlorine over the last four years has dropped about, not the price, but the volume itself. We were down, this year we used seven, roughly 7,000 gallons of chlorine. It's been upwards of 8,300 about four years ago. But there's a lot of factors involved. That's probably the main one. But also we had a little extended season four years ago. We were swimming longer. Maybe it was an exceptionally hot summer that year and evaporation or bather load, a lot goes into it. But that liner system definitely has improved things down there. Not only aesthetically, but operations wise. Now the other main concern down there and, uh, is our roof. Because there's two, there's two separate roofing systems for our park down there. Uh, the original rink roof was shingles back in the 70s. That was replaced in the 80s with a rubber membrane. And, but both roofing systems are, uh, are hurting. This is one of the, this is on top of the rink. For anyone who knows or is familiar with Casey Park, you're looking south right here. Falcon Park is past those trees right there. Uh, so where I was standing right here is actually on top of the <coughs> lobby back towards the back part shooting back, but you can kind of picture the, the, the uh, rink roof right there. And you can see it. And all those, uh, unfortunately, really didn't, uh, it's kind of an overcast day and it, I was hoping, but anytime you see a dark spot or something that looks a little different on the roof is a patch. Like there's, there's a shot of a, so, some different patches. That's looking now back the other way from the same spot. Now you can see the two different systems. This was taken, I'm standing about on, if you're familiar, you go in there, I'm standing about over the concession stand, back towards what we call the lifeguard room. Looking back, that's, that's looking directly west. And if you go in there, you know the skylights, that's there in the lobby. So you can see where water is, is ponding and where it's kind of, uh, the rubber's a little bit compromised. Same issue right there, that's looking back at the rink. You can see some of the discoloration towards the end. What really didn't translate well is around the uh, soffits down below, there's some rot and some where wind can get up in there and turn. So, you know, just more horror pictures of our, uh, so some of our uh, issues we have there. And this is gonna lead into something else. What you see there is the compressor room. That's, so you got the rubber roof and then you have that kind of brown uh, where it goes up. That's the compressor room in there that we looked at before where all the ice making equipment is and where actually the uh, facility boiler is to, for the heat. Another shot looking the other way. That rise in uh, right there is our ice resurfacer room, what everyone calls the Zamboni room. You can see so you can actually open it up and lift it up and that's where the snow ice shavings will come out into the melt pit. And this is one of the issues with our roof. This is, a, this is a picture in one of the bathrooms of some of the rotting or rot that has been caused by some leaks. So, but every, uh, we know to plan ahead, we watch the weather and when we see some heavy rain, we got the mop buckets out ready to catch it as it comes through. So we got the locations pretty good. Now roof replacement, um, you know, the, we've had a couple roofing specialists come out and look and the cost of the main building, which is the lobby, the locker room, that's about $95,000. And for the rink portion, it's about $125,000. So what uh, the manager and I are gonna hope to do is wrap this into our capital program to be considered for, you know, over the next few years to chip away at our needs down there. So that's, that's pretty much it. I, it's not, I hope that's not a scare tactic, but it's just some of the issues we face down there. Mike, what kind of use are you getting from the pool, number one, and uh, the, you know, the ice? The pool stays, the, uh, we'll take it uh, from summer on. The, the pool stays busy. You know, unfortunately, we're limited to uh, lifeguard availability. This is, you know, we've had a successful collaboration with the YMCA. They handle all of our pool operations as far as staffing and, and that. So I guess what's good about, well, the best part about the pool aspect is, that I think a lot, the majority of people who swim with us down at Casey Park, I think probably have limited options of where they can swim. So they're able to overcome a fear of water that, you know, as we all know, we all know somebody who's uncomfortable around water and it can really impact your life in a very negative way. So this, is, this allows a lot of people 
the ability to get in the water. And you know, if it's, it's all weather dependent. You know, if it's 95 degrees, it'll, it'll be packed. If it's 70, a little bit overcast and breezy, it won't be that busy. So it is getting good use. Yeah, very good use. Same, you know, and, and same with ice. You know, people who skate, the place means the world to them. You know, a lot of people don't skate, but they can still go, go down and have, you know, hot chocolate and watch whoever they're with skate. So um, it's, it's, it's well utilized. I, I had the, you know, the, I guess the privilege of having an office down there for a couple years, and it's really eye-opening how many people frequent the park, even during the day, whether they're walking or playing basketball or just stop in to use the bathroom. It's, uh, it's a nice destination. It's peaceful. Mike, what kind of condition is the rest of the park in? I, mm. I know we're going to do some work on the fields, a couple yeah. of softball fields. Like. Yeah, you know, we have lighting concerns, which we're going to address with this project. With, and this is softball. Uh, we, you know, we need some new infield dirt, need new fences, but some of that's going to be addressed in the project upcoming within the next two years. So, uh, you know, the, the fields themselves are in decent shape. Uh, the playground's in decent shape. It's a tough spot there, though, because it's so big and so broad. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways you can enter the park and, not, and no one even know you're there. I mean, not the, you know, that's just the reality. After hours, it's, uh, you know, there's probably more people there than we would like. But, um, you know, and unfortunately, vandalism's an issue there. So, but fortunately, when, you know, we, it goes in cycles like anywhere. Mike, we have a, as you all know, a growing, um once again, growing uh, softball league. It's, it's very active. Uh, and their, their tournaments, uh, the SMIGS tournament, is getting bigger and bigger each year. Um, can you give us a timeline again of, of the, um, the fields, that, that grant money that we are receiving that's going to um, rehab uh, Falcon Park, the Double Days field, as well as the um, two softball fields at Casey Park? Um, yes. Okay. Two with lighting and in, in, in field, well, new fencing and infield dirt. We'll call it dirt. It's really, it has a technical name, but for all intents and purposes, the, in, the dirt, the skin part of the field. So what we're doing is uh, obviously addressing Falcon Park first, which we're a week into that right now. And we're hoping to be able to make a movement towards Casey probably by the end of next summer, which is 2014. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably get the season in this upcoming 2014 season for softball and then be able to work on the fields. Okay, so the fall of 2014? Yeah, that's what we're, and if, we will get on it more quickly if we can. Okay, now is the, the city's doing the work on the fields? Yeah, we're, you know, as part of our match. So, um, so the new fences and then the lighting, are, are we using the lights that we're replacing from um, the Double Days field? Yes, but if obviously if there's money and if there's more money than we think, we might have to purchase some new lights too. Okay. But yeah, we're we're trying to reuse everything we can. The um, the bleachers are, are there. If there's money left over too, I mean I know that's yeah. Those are in there. Those are in need, and you know we we replace portions of it each year, and uh, you know bleachers. It, it, I, I guess back when the, the park was built, bleachers were great. You know, now everybody has the $3 fold-up chair around their shoulder as they come to all the events. So, sure. you know, I guess uh, bleachers of some sort will be in the Smithsonian at some point as you never see them anymore. But, yeah, it's, uh, you can hold a lot of people on those bleachers down there. Do people fill up those bleachers? No. Uh, you know, we might want to consider removing the bleachers and reinstalling modern type bleachers that are a little smaller and a little easier to maintain so the um we're going on the double days field uh they're doing the whole infield or they're doing the infield and the outfield and the outfield yeah and if anybody goes down uh, the outfield is totally stripped right now so and then they're moving to the infield tomorrow to start stripping that sod off so okay now is that sod reusable no, it's, it's crumpled up. We're using it at the landfill to cover, actually. But, you know, some people expressed interest in, uh, you know, reusing it places. But the problem is, once you take that side up, you better be ready to lay it down or else it dies. Yeah. And, the, you know, just nobody was ready for, for one thing, it's labor intensive to take it out if you do, if you want to reuse it. See, they just have a bulldozer and they're 
stripping it off. And we're putting it on the landfill for cover. Yeah, but really, you know, the condition of that, I know it doesn't sound very good, but the, the condition of that sod wasn't very good. You know, mm -hmm. it's been in there for a while. Is that a good idea to use that thick sod like that as cover material? Over well, it's on a slope. Where we're, we're going to use it is on a slope, not on garbage, but actually. So it's not slope. taking up space, landfill? No, I mean, we have to cover the slope. So. M Mike, I was down there the other day. I mean, they're really making hay with that. Yeah. Outfield, and there's a sewer line that runs through the middle of it. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? <laughs> now, the, the, the guys are down there. They scoped it out. They said it's pretty good shape. Uh, any feelings on that? No, I, I guess in, uh, you know, in hindsight, maybe they, it would have been nice if it was a little further to the, right. to the north. But, but it's funny, if you, if, you, if, if you pop the manhole, if, any, if anyone's familiar with baseball, it's kind of in the middle of left, left field. And if you pop the lid, it's actually about 20 feet deep. So it's kind of amazing. But, uh, yeah, there is a manhole right there. Of course, it, it'll, there'll be sand and sod over it, so it'll be safe to play on. But, but we GPSed it, so we know exactly where it is now. It's not going to be like down to the filtration or down to uh, the sewage treatment plant where there's a gas line running through it or anything. We hope not. We haven't run into that yet. Right. It so. Actually, they told me it runs away from the sewage treatment plant. Yeah, I think, Bill, you might know a little better than I, but I think it goes down to the interceptor there that's coming back through Tech Boulevard that they just replaced at some point. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was surprising, but we knew we knew the line was there. We didn't know the manhole was there. So I guess that's a left fielder's escape hatch. If he makes an error, he can just drop out of sight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for your time. Those are some needs, though, down at the park. Uh, we're excited about the construction. We're also excited uh, for the softball fields at Casey. So, but there are going to be some needs coming up that we we should address. <coughs> Going to do your landfill now presentation, Mike. I guess let me change my hat. All right. Doug, do we bring that PowerPoint? The Mike Mike has some slides. Okay. Yeah. The same one. From from the report that we yeah. distributed. Yeah. Okay. Now, which one uh, would you like? Because I really didn't know what to prepare. Because so, we've kind of talked about different subjects. Different um, I think it's on page, if I, my memory serves me correct, it's on page 39. Of that of that. Report yes. November. I want to say page 39. I might be within two or three pages. I only have it in a PDF. Are you looking at the, what, what's on that page? It's a, um, is that the, it's the 15.1 acres. Okay. It's that triangle piece. Yep. I've got that. I think it was option two, yes. Mike. Yes, it's option two. Option two. Option two. Oh, here it is right here. There's that. Why is your staple? There we go. Can everybody see this all right? I know it copied a little bit blurry. I apologize about that. Maybe it's just me blurry, but um, this is the landfill right here. It's an area, obviously an aerial photo of the landfill. The red line is the approximate boundaries. But if we go on what we did on that same aerial, if everyone remembers back in November when we kind of went over well, what we did, we did go over our different options that we could utilize, and I think right here is option two. Is that the one, Matt, yes. right there? Can we turn the lights on a little bit? Make us look better? Yeah, sorry about that, but I, we took it out and put and kind of cut it and cut and pasted it. So, so there's, here's where we are right here. This is what's known as, this is land, let's go back. This is landfill one, the closed landfill that was closed in the early 90s. This is landfill two, the one we're currently filling in. 
that was developed in the early 90s till current. We're still filling, this is cell four right here. So one of the op option one is to pursue some options to the west. Option two was to develop another standalone cell here. Option three was another smaller cell here. Option four was an overlay off of landfill one in conjunction with option two, so. Okay, now Mike, with option two, what I was originally thinking uh, was trying to find a site for our C and D, and as I've said before, um, you know, it's it's a shame to put the C and D um, where we're currently putting that. I mean, we don't get anything from it, uh, so I was wondering if we could use that option too. Um, and I guess, I'm no engineer, but a triangular shape, I guess, doesn't uh, uh, yield efficient space for, for C and D. So should we, t should we be able to take that 15-1 uh, site, um, excavate it, and while we are excavating it, use that ex excavation uh, material um, for, for daily cover? I mean, if we're going to use dirt, which I'm not thrilled about, but if we're going to use dirt for daily cover, while we're excavating it, we're saving ourselves money by using that for, uh, for daily cover. And um, at the same time, we're, we're, we're excavating the hole um, for the new cell. Is that something we could do? Yeah, that's uh, you know, it's sensible and a logical path of thinking. If you, if you can look where the cursor is right here, this is... Any soils that have been excavated for construction purposes on the site are stockpiled right here. And really what we try to do is stockpile it for the final cover phase, but we do have an excess, so we are using this area here. We don't have a permit for an on-site mine. It's not mining, it's, it's, it's soils that have been stored there. And is a big, I think if, uh, to recap the manager's closure of the budget from last year. Our expenses were down by close to a million, maybe a little over a million dollars last year at the landfill simply because we're using a lot of the soil on site. So yes, that is an option. If we were to excavate here and move the, we could stockpile it over here and it's an E, because this is where we're filling. It's still open up here too, but we're not currently filling there. So at the same time, we're digging out the footprint for a new cell. Right. And that's what we've done in the past. Anytime there's construction, the soils don't leave the site, they're stockpiled. And of course, if they, when you're in the construction phase, some of the, the permeability of the soils, I think you have to meet 10 to the minus five, which fortunately, if it, our soils are very tight down there. Somewhere is 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight, meaning there's not much that gets through them. They're, they're uh, hard, dense soils. So that is an option to do for option two if we wanted to convert that area there into a C and D section. Now, it, now, I'm saying we don't use the option two for C and D. I mean, do you think that's wise to use that for C and D or should we just use it for another landfill site for our regular municipal garbage? Yeah, um, you know, six to one, half dozen to the other. I think, I think segregating the garbage, if practical, is the right thing to do. I think the question is at this because, and it was surprising to me when, when we discussed it briefly last week, the last few days, I, you know, talking to the state and some consultants and looking in part 360, which is our, our solid waste guidelines, the, I, I thought the requirements for a C&D landfill would be a, a lot less stringent than they are. Basically what you save for a C&D landfill is a single composite liner versus a double composite. So, I guess what I, maybe I'm unclear, I guess here it is, the construction cost for a C&D landfill will be about 25 to 30% less than an MSW double lined, double composite liner system. Okay, maybe, maybe I, I, please tell me if I read this wrong, um, and I was just doing some digging on my own. If, if there's a, if we're making space for C&D, and um, if it's less than three, anch three acres, there's no liner needed if we're using it for C&D? There's a compacted clay liner that you need. 
Okay, but but not the but not the constructed composite land, and okay. the, and I, I believe that clay liner has to be ten to the minus five. Okay, or it's it has to meet those specifications. All right. All right, and then I thought I read if it's over three acres, uh, it is needed. Then you go into the single composite liner. And unfortunately also, even if we were to stay three acres or less, we would still have, it's the same permitting requirements as an MSW, so we would have to do the hydrogeologic investigation, we'd have to do bedrock separation, we would have to still do groundwater monitoring with wells around it, and surprising to me, you also have to have gas collection, not for methane, but for hydrogen sulfide, which this is what C and D gives off, which is really a, I hate to say worthless, but it's a gas that really has no value to us at all. You can't run equipment on it, you can't run vehicles, it's, you would have to flare that. That's why it was surprising to me after you brought it up last week doing a little research that you save on, you can save on the construction cost for a C and D, but all the permitting, closure and post-closure requirements are the same as if you had an MSW landfill. Isn't there a gas line somewhere there? There's a gas line, uh, let me get right here, you can see it. Watch the cursor. Mm -hmm. This is a big, I believe it's a 30 inch gas line. You can see it kind of goes right through the site. Right. Actually it comes up here, follows here. That is, um, I, I, it's not Buckeye, it's one of the other large gas suppliers. And it's natural gas. So, uh, now the liners, uh, uh, to be honest, are the liners more lip service than anything else? I mean, couldn't a bunch of rats or a hungry woodchuck be able to eat right through one of them? No. No? You, you know, the, if, and, and to, to be honest with you, I know rats are associated, I've never seen a rat down there. It's amazing, I guess the hawks are doing their job, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the, there's a lot of, um, laboratory testing for the liner material, both compression and tensile, I believe, and they have to meet specifications in the laboratory before they can be, and you know, people a lot smarter than I could develop those, those requirements at the state level. So, so Mike, in your opinion, in that option two, you think we should use it for C and D, or do you think we should use it for um, dig it up and use it, put in another cell? Well, as I, as I said before, I think we've, we've proven that we really can't compete with the larger landfills down the road. And I, I assume you mean use it for another cell, meaning an- Municipal garbage. Yeah, an MSW. Right. It, you know, it, it'd be expensive again, and we'd be committing ourselves, because I, I just went back four years, and our curbside, and this, these are, and we were, we're fortunate, if you like research, you can do research on garbage here in the city because we offer a collection service. And just in four years, our residents are generating 8% less garbage than we did four years ago. Uh, we're down less, and I, I take it by calendar year because that's what our permit is. It's per the calendar year, whereas our budget is a different season. But So I guess what I'm getting at, there's less garbage out there, counselor, and it's just that much more competitive to get what's out there. So then we can ex excavate it, use that dirt that was excavated as cover, and then we could use this site for C and D. Yeah, but there, remember there'd be construction costs also for that uh, C and D. Right, but the but that's it's cheaper though than putting in a yes, right, than by you know roughly thirty percent cheaper. So that's one plan that we could look at. So then we'd be separating the C and D, not going into the municipal, uh, and going into the other cells, which is going to save space, and we will get better methane production. Yeah, and I get I, the big picture. It would make sense to utilize every available nook and cranny we have down there for some constructive purpose. Um, I think what we have to really look at carefully is. A, who we're gonna compete against. And if we did a C and D section, obviously it's, there's some reduced expenses with maintaining and operating also. Even though the, re, the cover requirements are the same, you know, I think we could get a little bit more creative in that. Um, now the issue of, and the last time I looked, um, I think I have the numbers here. Uh, we were taking what between 10 to 15,000 tons per year out of county um, of C and D waste. Uh, so, 
I think the norm from the last time we looked, uh, the city records show that we were, we were normal average was like 5,000 tons per year of C and D. Yeah, and bear with me one second. Okay, no problem. I, I can Am I trying to light a little bit? No, I, I think I, I'll know it when I see it because <laughs> I know what's in here. Yeah, it does make it easier. So, once again, I like to go by calendar year because that's how we compare ourselves in the solid waste industry. Let me look at... Let's see. Our annual reports from the last two years, what it, and to, while I'm searching here for what I'm looking for, about 78% of the waste we bring in is MSW. About 20% is CND, and how we, and the other 2% is sludge or grit or uh, other material. How we come up with those numbers? 20% is sludge, you said? No, 20% is CND. Okay, CND. Yep. And how we get these numbers are. It, and some people are, are a little bit offended, but they think they're being interrogated. It's not that we don't trust any, but we ask people where it's from and what it is. <clears throat> so, um, unfortunately, some people don't like to be asked about their garbage, but that's how we can, that's how we're accurate with our data. Now, from January, and you know what I didn't do? I, I can make a copy for everybody. I'll tell you what, I'll email this to everybody tomorrow. From January 1st up until October 7th, originating from the city of Auburn, and this isn't just garbage, this is whatever somebody pays for, is uh, 16,000 tons of material. It also includes anybody who brought brush in or something like that. Now the C&D, if you broke that down, let's see. Once again, sorry, I know we discussed it last week, but it, in the seven days up till now. I tried to get as much information as possible to hopefully answer some of the questions. From Cayuga County, we've received 15,000 tons of material. Outside of Cayuga County, 13,000 tons. And remember, that's from January till now. So 13,000 tons from outside the county? Yep. And 15,000 from inside the county? From inside the county, outside the city. Mike, what are we permitted to take yearly down there? Pardon me? What are we permitted yearly? 96,000 tons. And where are we? Um, you know, I don't, have, I don't have that year to date. I know last year we were at 89 through the calendar year, and we're probably, we're probably gonna be anywhere from 60 to 70,000 tons this year. Mike, is that... Um I'm sorry if I missed it because I was writing this. Is that 15,000 tons of C&D or 13,000 tons outside the city C&D? No. Okay. That, that's both, and that's where I apologize. I should have separated that out, but I didn't. So that's so. combined um, regular garbage and C&D waste. Yeah. Mike, now one of the options that's not up on the board is one of the options we talked a while ago about um, limiting the um, just to local haulers or just to local trash, I should say, not local haulers, because one of the problems that we've been having over the years is not charging enough for the trash we're taking in. We've got debt service with the landfill. We haven't been covering that debt service that we have, and we've been accelerating the rate of filling that garbage into the landfill. So if we were just to take in local trash, we probably would get 10 years out of the site we're in now, correct? Roughly, yeah. And that would go hand in hand in the debt service because we. I think last we talked, we still had about 10 years of debt service on that, on that landfill. You know, I, it's it's been a while since I looked at that end of it. So if you could get, if those I could, numbers, if I could look at that, sure. If you could get those numbers, because what I'm concerned is that we're going to be off incurring more debt and still have debt on a, a landfill that's going to be closed shortly. And um, I'd like to see us move in an area where we're trying to just take care of our local res residents, pay down the debt that we have on that site now before we move into other, other spots. And any haulers that are bringing trash into the landfill are paying enough to cover our costs 
they should be covering our cost, if not making some administrative costs on that also because of the exposure we have with all the debt that's it's at that landfill. So I'd like to see that as a as an option five. I think we talked about that last time. I think there you got four of them up there, but I think that's important that we look at that one because of the of the debt service and not incurring more debt with right. bringing over debt from the past landfill, something that's happened with the city over the years, unfortunately. Now, Mike, one of the negative reactions to that, that theory there is the price of the garbage would go up. The price per ton goes up. I, in, it, it's, ki it's kind of, it's not tricky math uh, or math to trick anybody, but you have your, all your landfill costs are pretty much fixed costs, construction costs. So you know what that is right at the beginning. Now, how do you reduce that? And everything, again, is divide, your denominator is always going to be your tonnage. So your 96,000 tons, that cost, whatever that total cost is, is always going to be divided by that 96,000 tons or 80,000 or 75,000 that you're bringing in. So I, I hope everyone can follow me that if that denominator gets reduced from 96 to, if we were to cut everyone off to 50,000 tons, that quotient comes out to be a lot higher, which is your cost per ton. I, gonna, I hope I just didn't It's not going to be higher because if you're opening up a new landfill, you're going to incur more costs opening a landfill. So it's going to average itself out with that cost. But the problem is we've got 10 years of debt with this landfill. We've been taking tonnage in down there and not covering our costs over the years, filling the space, but incurring all this debt, transferring money to the general fund and so on and so forth to balance past budgets. Those are the things we need to look at that we're covering our costs with every ton of garbage that's coming in that landfill to cover the debt service. And that's what we got to be very careful of is how we move forward, not incurring more debt, able to pay the cost, the debt we have, because the debt's not going to go away. We're, we're obligated to pay it. And, and hopefully from tonight what we can do is, is kind of point us in a direction that then we know what we can research and, and bring back what everybody wants to see. Well, I guess we can start from here. I think one of the things that I like to see, and, and, and tell me what we're doing presently, is, and I mentioned this before, is, is preventing the, um, having a little bit more control on what's being put in there. So if that means that we number each private container, if we, we spray paint it, if we put a sticker on it, um, you know, four, six inches high, um, and then put a number on that on that landfill scale ticket um, each time that container comes into the landfill. I mean, are, do we have any type of process that's doing that? The pro the process of control right now is, st I guess, standard for for the landfilling business. And how that is, it's done by you have to have a permit to come in, okay? And you and it's tracked by license plate number. From that license plate number, you have owner information and location of the residents. So they have to prove where they live. You have to bring in your vehicle registration and your driver's license. Everything has to match. So as far as origin, you know, you hope people are honest. They could be registered in the city, but who knows? The garbage could be from Moravia, you know? And when we ask them where the garbage is from, you know, the maybe less than honest person would say, well, it's from Auburn, because he knows he's got an Auburn plate and it's coming up that his, his address is Auburn. But I, I know what you're getting at, Counselor, but it's a, we take people for what they tell us because that's the only way we can, we can do it right now is to a actually ask them. Well, and that's, and that's I guess, my concern is, and as you well know, this is a, this is a multi-million dollar business. And to have uh, a third party uh, involved to, to, to run the tickets, uh, and, and to check the locations from time to time, see where they, um, where they say the dumpsters are coming from. I mean, this, in the end, is going to save the landfill space, which therefore is going to save uh, volume and therefore is going to save money. Um, and if there is any potential abuse down there, we can, we can put a stop to it. Uh, but, you know, it's, that's, that's our space, that's our time, that's our money that we're losing here. Um, and this is a... This is a big, a big part of our of our city operations, as, as you're fully aware of. Yeah, I, I guess if it's decided not to take anybody's garbage but city resident garbage, you know, we could start that tomorrow. But on, on the downside of that, you'd immediately see 
you know, a million dollars, like that tonnage I just rattled off equates to a million dollars in revenue so far this year. Um, but are, are we getting our costs, though, from what we're taking in from outside the city residents, though? Are we recovering our costs? That's the concern that I have on yeah, that. It's, you know, are, are we getting enough for the tonnage? And Well, that tonnage the game, right there. But, at one stage of the game, I think you were, they were, the city was charging like $20 a ton. That was for, that's for the long haul garbage. These people yeah. who are coming in are paying, there's only one customer that's in the low 20s. That was, no, there's two. They're, they're haulers. And, and that's not covering our cost. N no. At 96,000 tons, if you accept that in, yeah, you do cover your costs. But if you're only bringing in 70,000 tons and 10 or 15,000 of that ton is at $22 a ton, no, you're not. Mike, as we talked about one time, there's a certain amount of volume, volume in that landfill, and there's debt associated with that volume. Right. And they got to go hand in hand. And you got to be able to pay for your overhead costs plus the debt that you have on that. And whatever you're taking a ton is got to be able to cover your costs. So, but just one thing with Councillor uh, Smith's comment there, when we were at uh, Seneca Meadows, they, they uh, filmed every car, took a picture of every car that came in, recorded the plate, and so on and so forth. Do we do that stuff at our facility? No, we don't facility? have a camera down there. Is, is that an you know, expensive ticket to well, put on? Well, it was talked about at one point, and I think at that time it was going to be about, and I don't know much about surveillance equipment, but I think it was about twelve to $15,000 to install a system that has the capability of recording for 30 days and then purging itself. Mike, you're doing the same thing, though, but manually. Am I what? correct? Well, you're, you're logging every license plate? Am I yeah, correct? Or? Yeah, every, every, license, every transaction is logged, and it's, it's, I get a daily report at the end of each day. I don't get the license plate. I, I, if I wanted the license plate numbers, I would call and the system would, Karen would print it out that way, but I just get the material code and an origin code. So. Mike, right now you could tell us approximately, in, in council, you, you don't have to agree with this, but just if you hear me through, you can tell us right now what it's costing each, of, each homeowner, property owner, for, for the landfill use. For pretty, I would say relatively easily. Probably pretty close. I didn't look... Um, I, I didn't look at the the pie chart this year for this this budget year because we haven't gotten the budget yet. But last time I did the math, it was. Um, I'm going to yeah. jump ahead of you, Mike. I'm not going to look for. I'm not going to ask for numbers right now. But okay. if we were to separate this out, uh, so it was just for land or for city residents only. If we didn't take any any other garbage and come up with a figure, so. It, it may be a little bit easier for all of us to see what it would cost us to eliminate some of our customers. And, and I don't want you to go through a, a very large work, you know, exercise here to do that. Well, I think we've done that in various fashions over the years, and I can, I can come back with more current data. I guess is how, how to how to put it. Yeah, I guess what does it cost me as a homeowner in the city with everyone else paying into it versus what would it cost me if just city residents' businesses were allowed to use the landfill? And, and therefore, by, by doing that, if we were to eliminate everyone else, it would prolong our, our, our life, our longevity with, with the cell. Uh, answering somewhat of Councilor Camaro's question is, uh, can we pay for this? But what does it cost us to pay for that? I, and Mike, so you're saying we do have the information that gives us who brought in, what type of waste, what did they pay uh, per ton and per year. Um, we have that information. Yeah. What, here's how you know our, we're we're small. Our customer base is small. So there's there's really well you can break it down into in the subcategories, but there's really people who come in. Like you and I, residents, we, we have a decal, you pay $72 a ton, okay? Then we have a group of local haulers and not preference for any company, but everyone's seen their trucks, your waste managements, your Robinsons, your Morgan, your um, Casella, they're paying $39 a ton, but they're bringing in a lot more tonnage than you and I would bring in. And that's, I guess that's where the sticky, sticky things are with the solid waste business. It's, it's volume, it's volume based. The more garbage you can commit to a place, the less your price is going to be. 
simply because, like Councilor Camardo, you said, you got your, your, your expenses and you know what your fixed costs are because you've already built the land. See, I think you're getting lost, or the equation gets lost when it looks at volume because at that landfill, you're going to have so much tonnage you're going to bring in to the cell. Mm -hmm. There's overhead a cost, you know, there's uh, operating budgets every year that you got to bring into consideration, debt service, and that's where this volume basis is kind of lost or gone by the wayside because you got to recover those unit costs for a ton that you can put in that landfill. And something the city's gotten away from over the years, they thought they could bring in all this volume, but they still had debt service. Mm -hmm. So they were taking a lot of that money, transferring it to the general fund because it was a cash cow, so to speak. But we weren't covering our costs. That's why we've been carrying over some of this debt year after year to different to different phases, going back to the last 20 or 30 years, however that landfill's been, the Linard landfill's been in existence. So that's that's a difficult thing unless you look at your actual unit costs across the board. And that's something that we really try to should try to strive to get so that we know what we're selling a, a unit of garbage or a ton of garbage for and to make sure we're covering our costs. And when I came in, we were we were selling it was like twenty two dollars a ton, and they asked the question, "How much does it cost us? Just give us our costs for operations." And it was thirty three dollars a ton, and that's when they did uh, they passed this the the miracle fill plan, and that's when we extended it. Was it that's when we extended it to ninety five thousand? Correct. Yeah, there was yeah ninety six. Ninety six thousand. So. Everyone was bringing it in, and, and mm -hmm. I think to your point, you're mistaking cash for revenue. Right. Now, Mike, if we did this, let's say we raised the um, out of county C and D cost. I'm just throwing a number out. Mm -hmm. Let's say we raised the out of city C and D cost to to ninety five dollars per ton. So, what we're obviously doing is we're in, in or. or if we place a moratorium on um, out-of-city waste, so we're, we're saving more space for for our local residents, um, you say, well, they're just going to go down the road and go to Seneca Meadows. That could be a possible option that they would they could take, um, but at the same time, that also brings some inconvenience for them as well, waiting, uh, the traveling, and so forth. What would be, other than the downsides that, that I just mentioned, what would be another downside? Lack of revenue? That's the immediate one. That's the one that will jump right out at you. But who knows? Those people might do the math, and we, we can all do the math as far as per mile cost for fuel, rubber, insurance, liability. And, you know, companies do it different ways. The way I did it, to get from our place to, you know, a landfill 35 miles away, roughly would cost us, and I haven't done the math in a while, but about $4 a mile. That's not including your tipping fee, though. That's just your travel cost. So, yeah, it might be some people, if we went to $95 a ton, you know, that, that drive might really not be worth it to them. See, that's one thing I can never understand is the people that pay for that landfill through their tax dollars are being charged $72 a ton to use that facility that they pay for. But somebody else can come in and pay twenty or twenty-two dollars over the past years is what's happened down there, and that's yeah. And those uh, and that's just an unfortunate. And your your facts are correct, but those aren't aren't individuals coming, and in. those are companies that, that whatever have might be yeah, whatever it might be. It's yeah. still a very discounted amount, below way below our costs. So I, I like to see, I like to have us seriously consider um, doing that, raising ninety-five dollars per ton to 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 outside users. I mean, we're going to save our space, and let's let's see what happens. I mean, what's I mean, we're losing space now. We're filling it with C and D that's absolutely useless. We don't have a separate site for C and D. Um, why not? And how long did you say, Mike? You think you get ten years out of that cell if we limited the amount of volume that came in? Yeah, you know, eight, yeah, depending once again how many tons you bring in. Well, I think, like Councilor Smith said, we need to look at the numbers and doing something in this area. Yeah, and it's, pro it's probably prudent to do that because, like I said, we, we always have a good baseline here because we have a good mix of business and residential garbage that we physically pick up. So we've got a direct handle on, you know, purchase fluctuations of, you know, you know when Christmas is, you know, because the... Sure tonnage goes up but you know times are tough and like I said and it's probably if you did the numbers nationwide 
We're probably right under. Our residents are generating 8% less garbage than we did four years ago. Is that because, why, why do you think that? Because doing a better job of recycling or? I think so, yeah. you know, and it, you, recycling rates are up, but also people are buying less. Um, you know, it's conserve. Everybody wants to conserve, reuse. Is there, is there more we can do in the recycling area so we're not putting recycled materials in the landfill? Yeah, you know, we try to minimize that. Obviously, it's part of our permit, and we do reject some of these other companies that if they have excessive recycled material, as soon as they open it up on our operators right there, we'll turn, we'll turn them away. Um, the rates will uh, automatically probably reduce the amount that we get in, but it's one of those things where we probably today can't predict exactly what the response will be. And to the point that I've heard here, Maybe we need to just go ahead and do it yeah. and see what happens. And if it's detrimental, we come back to the council and we say this isn't working. We need to do something different. If we go the way we are now, we have a landfill that's going to get filled up sooner than later. All right. And then, and then now the, the people who paid for that landfill aren't going to have anywhere to put their garbage. Plus, we're still going to have debt on it. Plus, we're still going to have debt on it. Exactly. So personally, I think we should, and we've tried to reach out to the county. Um, you know, we've tried for years. Um, Councilor asked the one question three months ago. I think we got we get the answer the next day um, from them. About we, expanding. About expanding. Uh, the county doesn't want to help us with this with this situation, which is their prerogative. So I, I think we we raise that to ninety five dollars per ton, and I say we do it next week. Yeah. Um, like I said it before, and uh, this is a rehash, pretty much of what we. We talked about a few, maybe just a little more than maybe a couple of months ago. Is there is there is that uh, spot, and, and I call it the sweet spot of, of you know price, and you know it's based basically supply and demand, and there's a there's going to be that price point where you're going to lower your intake, but your revenues are going to be either neutral or to the plus. Ideally, that's what you want, and. Until you kind of poke around with the number, you're never going to find it. So I think by doing this iteratively, at least at this point, by by uh, going ahead, going forward like that with the, let's say the $95 rate, now you're you've got your first data point. You're going to find out what impact that has. I mean, first off, you're going to have to wait a while for the uh, uh, the thing to settle. Like anything, when you upset a system, it has to damp down. Uh, so it's not going to be, you're not going to get the valid numbers right away, maybe within, you know, up to maybe a, a half a year, but you will find out what the market bears. And uh, again, you got the, the weight, weighted factors are the transportation costs versus the, uh, the costs of, of, uh, of a local haul versus, a, a, let's say, a distant haul. So, I mean, these, these without uh, any data, to uh, to find out what that number really is, uh, you can talk about it all you want, but you're not going to get anywhere. So I think I agree with the fact that we need to uh, at least get get start and get some uh, data points. Mike, before we move ahead with this, are our accounts receivables with these haulers? Are they pretty much paid down, or do they yeah, still the owe us quite one, a bit of money? Um, the big one was WeCare, and they have two accounts. They uh, the owner West sent an email. The beginning of the week the refinancing is done he should have both of those accounts paid off by within two weeks what's he what do they owe us uh it's down to i think seventy-five thousand. you know they've been paying about twenty thousand dollars a month and they've been cut off so um but you know he is he so before we renew with anybody they'll, they'll be paid off then correct yeah and i think for a larger volume people like that is to have a performance bond sure and he has agreed to put up five, a five hundred thousand dollar bond obviously if he becomes delinquent we exercise that bond sure but we always have uh you know because some companies receivables are either 45 some are 50 days ours our terms are 30 days so unfortunately with some of these larger companies we get paid regularly and they pay the interest but they always show up on, you know, delinquent. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so I, I'm in. I'm in favor of raising rates. Is, is that a consensus among council? Yes, I, I agree with that. 
Eight. I'd like to see some numbers first, Mike. What, what about city residents? No, I, I think the no. counties, in my opinion, the, the counties and the towns raise their rates uh, now and save the, val the volume for, for the Auburn taxpayers. All but city residents, in my estimation. Okay. So, so council, it's a consensus among council to, mm -hmm. to raise, uh, to raise the out, out of city rates. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Council Graney asked for more numbers and, and I tend to agree with him before I, I agreed to $95 a ton. I, I'd like to see some numbers in, 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 sure. in working towards a sweet spot as we, as we've mentioned before. Yeah, there's a, there's definitely gotta be, uh, there's a, you know, a financial sensitivity study that needs to be done. Um, but you need some data sets from other other haulers which are not other haulers but other landfills and they're not likely to give you that so uh, well, I've think got some uh, uh, some are secretive right right some some change by the hour mm -hmm. uh, some change by whoever you ask right. <laughs> <laughs> but here if, if bear with me once again like I said the last week I've just been trying to pull as much information as possible no, Mike, what happens, uh, this is a scenario that's out there, what happens with our businesses that use, city businesses that use local haulers for dumpsters and things like that? Well, Can there be something worked out with them because they are part, they are paying taxes in the city and so on and so forth? Um, but the hauler they're using probably picked up five other stuff. Yeah. material outside the city, then they'd be paying $95 a ton. Mm -hmm. So that's something we want to think about. But they, well, they have a contract with that company. What the terms are, I, I'm not, a, you know, yeah, but all terms are different. The rates go up. The rates are for the, for the uh, you know, yeah. the businesses are going to go up also. But here, um, I can just, Cortland County landfill, they're roughly at $60 a ton. But what they have there, they only accept Cortland County waste. So it's really probably not a good comparison for us. I think they are opening it up for outside waste. Madison County is $65 a ton. For outside? Uh, for, well, they only accept, it's, yeah, flow control in effect, forcing all waste in Madison County to be disposed of in the county landfill. Oneida Herkimer, once again, they have a, a, a couple of counties involved in that authority, so they enacted flow control. So they're guaranteed the tonnage, they're at 72 a ton. But, uh, Council, you might be right, maybe these uh, people will adjust. Yeah, I, I I really think they will. I think we have nothing we have nothing to lose. And if nothing else, we're extending the life of our absolutely our landfill. Well, the the, the cost of uh, of an uh, additional growth in the landfill, we already know the cost there. Right. Now that that option two up there, going back to that, so we are in a consensus. Um, Councilor Graney wants numbers. Now the option two there with the um, using that site for. Um, excavating it, using it for daily cover, and then for potential C&D use later. Um, what's the cost for doing that? Is there a number that you well, have? Well, there's a couple different things we have to consider. If we were to just right now decide, okay, we want to take the material out there, utilize it as daily cover, what we would have to do is develop a, a mining plan and, and apply for a mining permit. Included with that is a, is a reclamation plan for what you're going to do with the site after it's you have a pit there and what that that's obviously a state law that's to prevent anybody just excavating in their backyard and we've all seen abandoned sand pits out in the country and they can be a hazard so but that would be that's, those are minor things it's been a while since i've looked at a a mining plan but you know there's certain requirements it's you have to submit it's a permitting process but it's there's not many hurdles, I don't believe. This may help in the uh, feasibility study to develop that site for MSW was 13,672,000. So if we take 30% off of that, as Mike suggested, then if you were to go all 15, 9 acres. million or something like that, 8 million. Yeah. For a C and D site. Yeah. Right. If you wanted to do the entire, if you did the whole, the whole as it's laid out there. An option two site. Right. So now, a C and D. If we had that for a C and D site, um, what's the lifespan of a C and D site? How does that? I'm I know it depends on your volume, but 
Well, it's, you know, most of it's bony material and it's not going to compact. It's not really not going to decompose quickly. But we could use it though for city projects, some of that stuff, grind it up, use it yeah. for backfill. Some communities with success, you know, there's a lot of what uh, reclaiming. So you get a door in there, you take the hinges off, you take the doorknob off. Someone will buy that, you know, but unfortunately, you got to have somebody to do it. That's the thing. There are there are different options with a and d which we are just not familiar with because we've never run a strictly C&D site. There's one right over in Camillus that's well run. It's been there forever. Um, I, you know, I didn't have a chance to go over there between last Thursday and this Thursday, but I plan on doing that next week just to see what uh, anything they can identify as a, just a major downfall of it, which I don't think there is one. Well, because it, it's, uh, you know, not compressible, I mean, you're going to, the airspace will be a, an issue. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't shrink down like the uh, MSW does. Yep. Yeah. Another problem, like you just says, you own it forever. Right. Yeah. And there's regulations forever. forever. Right. The closure and post-closure requirements aren't different for a C&D as opposed to an MSW. So, and there's groundwater monitoring. Like I said, there's, uh, you know, you have to uh, the gas. collect the gas. But for the next 100 years. Yeah. Yeah, but the, but look what the consequences of us not having a C&D site is, though. Would we be better served having a grinder? For the C and D, would we, what would be the cost breakdown for a grinder versus uh, the, the the space that we're losing? There are advantages to grinders. You know, I think they can run. You know, you can buy the Taj Mahal if you want for two million dollars. You can probably get a grinder for probably eight hundred thousand or eight hundred fifty thousand. And then you, there's a couple of equipment needs we would have to address how to feed the grinder and. Then you have, you know, they're just high maintenance. They're, well, well, what, the, what the people we've had come in with grinders tell us that, you know, about 130 to 170 thousand dollars a year in maintenance costs. What, what I'm, what I'm working out in my mind is, uh, Doug just came up with the figures of approximately eight to nine million dollars to create a cell for for C and D, and and I don't disagree with you, Councillor Smith, but at the same time, will we be better off once, twice a year leasing a grinder to come in, and can we use that for cover material? Is, it, is that allowed? Which would, you know, certainly cut down, give us, certainly give us more space. Depends on the no, I, size and permeability of which. Or we allowed. do, or we just yeah. take in the C and D from our local residents, which we'll put it on the curb and not take anything else in at all, and not take in C D at the landfill. Other than other than residents. other than from the city, it's just the residents, right? They put it out to the curb, and which is very limited, I would assume. Is that like well, you, you have some people yeah. that yeah. you know, like contractors that would want to. In. I mean, it can't be just curbside pickup. You got well, you try to limit it as much as you can, is my point, instead of taking large quantities, filling a lined landfill. Well, if they're from local contractors building within the city, uh, you know, it almost the hauling it. tied into a permit. Right. Mike, are you, you are going to Camillus to check them out? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me know when you go. Yeah. But again, if you grind it, the C and D, you, 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 you know, it depends on what what you got left as far as its size and permeability. I mean, it has to have certain amount of of uh, granularity. Otherwise, you know, when, if you put it on there, if it's too fine, the, the water doesn't uh, ingress. So you, it's and that's it. We would have to submit a sample to the state right. with some laboratory to back it up. So and there would be there would have to be some in. statistical sampling done in order to maintain that that uh, normal d uh, size. Just before we leave the point, um, can just give it some thought. Maybe you can figure something out. But I like to try to look at um, giving a break to the local businesses that use, you know, local haulers for trash, because I think that might be a difficult thing for them. Assume a ninety-five dollar a ton, on, you know, on top of, you know, paying the regular taxes that they're not receiving that curbside pickup because they got it. I can understand. Out back, but maybe there's something we can do. I can understand that, but to Mike's point, he says, if, if let's say the guy's picking up from other places outside of the city, and that's just another stop in his run. Uh, you figure out how much tonnage yeah. they're using or whatever, and try to do something in that area. Where he can get an idea of his container size, right? And, and how much he like uses that. throughout the year, and give him some kind of a break in that or something. Maybe we have something we can build and look at. What we're looking at, though, is if the hauler is picking it up from outside the city. <laughs> They're not going to be allowed into the landfill anyway, unless at a higher rate. That's but, why. That's why I think the monitoring is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. it's everything. But then, how do we have the 
we're not going to take any local garbage in within somebody out picking up containers in the city is that what you, is what we're talking about no, no we're saying because if the, i got a restaurant and i got a dumpster out in the back of my restaurant or whatever how do you you're, you're saying don't do that no, I'm, no, I'm, it's inside the city, so right. we would take that. Sure. But that brings up another question. Do we, uh, are, the, are dumpsters numbered or, or ticketed? I know some communities do that. They have like a, 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 like a, a number on each individual dumpsters. No, we, we don't provide dumpsters. We don't. But the companies, I'm sure, have some numbering system. But we don't because a truck, a particular what are called roll-off trucks, might bring in 10 different boxes in one day. So I'm sure they have some kind of roster of where they know where their number like box 10a is mm -hmm. at this location box 14c is over there uh, but as far as we go like i said we go by license plate number i don't see how it could be enforced i mean some of these trucks they're all over the county picking sure up garbage. Yeah. i see a problem there yeah I so mean, i guess to be specific what? for just city residents we we obviously need more discussion but i think one thing we could do is have some exploratory discussions with the haulers and basically say we're seriously considering raising our rates mm -hmm. to 95 dollars a ton see what kind of feedback we get whether they're interested in renewing their contracts under that uh term or not and then report back to the council on that issue and then maybe do some more refinement on the issue of a c and d landfill after Mike does some more investigation and maybe nail down some harder costs on that and what the demand might be for utilization of that. I think one of the problems you're going to have is all these restaurants and these people that are having garbage pickup, when they're told they're going to jack the rate by $95, they're going to be down here screaming. See, the Auburn, see I don't think we jack them up, but the city ones. How are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to make sure everything you get in a truck that's from, from these haulers is from local restaurants. That's well, you look at the tonnage that they're 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 putting in that truck every year. They got bills they can go back in, and you give them a you break on that air uh, that that tonnage. That's a good point. How how does the how does the hauler how is it bill? Determined? Does the, does the hauler? Well, we would we would discount those prices for that hauler in the city, and it's something yeah, that you I could look at. I, I mean, we're not the problem's not the, not from restaurants. We're talking about the construction demolition stuff. That's what I'm looking at. The, 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 C, the C and D cost, I say we raise on the uh, out of the city users. I, I guess an easy way to do that, and e well, it would be easy to me, is to roll off boxes would be at the higher rate, whereas packers, like we're yes. all accustomed to seeing, mm -hmm. of that do pick up the residential, probably right. we could have a lesser rate for them. Right. Because C and D is very, these haulers very rarely will haul C and D in a pack or simply because things get lodged in there and you, you spend a half hour trying to clean the thing out. Yeah, you're going to see it in the big roll-offs. In the roll-offs, right. yeah. Roll-off container. So that's, those are the ones I'm aiming at. I, that's, those are the ones I want to target. Because that's, that's shameful that they're putting that in our landfill, in a double-lined landfill. So. so then how do you handle the garbage that's coming in and you're not charging appropriately for the garbage that's coming in outside the city? At twenty-two dollars or twenty dollars a ton. Well, those are contracts. I mean, how, we I might, think I think we should raise all the rates, but that will get raised less than the roll-off boxes. How many how many uh, contracts do we have that are at the twenty, twenty-two, twenty-five? Just one. Just one. Oh, yeah. Let me take note two, but one never one hardly ever comes in. Right. Roselli, a big hauler out of uh, Syracuse, they hardly ever come in. The only time they come in is with now. Because I think they're, they've backed out of the tractor trailer business, maybe, but they only bring a little roll off in so, once in a while. So, right now, for the most part, we are selling at cost. Yes. Mm -hmm. And once again, it comes back to the What's math. The cost. <laughs> so, yeah. You probably got to do some research on this, Mike, to get yeah. back to us. I think we got to yeah. do it. You know what I have to figure out is how to, so we're all on the same page, how, to, how the math breaks down a little easier and a little. Uh, because uh, I know I can be confusing at times, but it makes sense to me. So I got to figure out how to translate that so it's uh, so everybody can well, can see it. Mike, I, you know, for the majority of city, city residents, restaurants excluded, of course, it's it's all done by pickup, um, by pickup by by our trucks. Um, so that being said, the majority of the, the people, it'll be transparent. Uh, the 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 sticky issue, and I can see what 
John's talking about here is, is if you've got a restaurant owner that's got a, uh, you know, a, a dumpster back there and a, and a outside hauler brings it, well, there's no way of knowing exactly what weight is in there. And, they, and I know they don't weigh these things when they, before they throw them in their, you know, dump them in their truck. So to separate a cost for for let's say this restaurant tour that has a that has a dumpster versus what he distri uh, uh, dumps in the uh, into the the truck that picks it up versus what's already in there from outside haulers that's where it gets kind of dicey that's why i think we stick with the roll offs so right for, forget the packers all right let's stick with the roll offs because we know that's c and d in there and let's jack the prices up on those boys and you know, in that respect, they, they do pick up restaurants and packers, which are garbage trucks, and that's right. Right. that's the organics we want. Sure, we want that stuff. You know, that's good. Method. We want those 150, 200 pound cans that are, yes. you know, right chicken, because obviously it's it's not it's not regulated now that are so much so much organics is in the waste stream. That's sure. what they're trying to go towards, but nobody's near that yet. So can we at least then just focus in on the roll offs and raising those prices, ninety five dollars a ton. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't have a problem with the with the uh, something that's an obviously a C and D, which is a roll off. Continue. Yeah, that's all I was pertaining to. Okay. Yeah, what, um, let's see. We're at October tenth right now. When would you want to start? I know you said immediately. I, I think as soon as we can, because time is of the essence with the landfill. Okay. How about if you can give us uh, till. And the 21st, which is the following Monday, is sure. that okay? So we can, that'll give us a week to contact our customers and let them know what we're doing. And, and in fact, you could probably even get some. Uh, they'll give you some immediate feedback, I'm sure. Oh, and yeah. let us any. I come into my ears this big. Yeah, I, let us know of any problems that might exist, Mike, with us moving forward in this area. That you hear any problems that you think that might. You know, other than somebody complaining that. Gas is 325 instead of 315. You know, nobody wants to pay more. Let's right. face it, and that's not that's not a pleasant message to give to anybody that they are going to be paying more. But um, you know, there's a couple of local haulers. I'm sure you you folks will get a call from. So, sure. I, I, no doubt. But we're all in it together, and I, you know, and I think the haulers need to understand that also. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Oh, thanks for your time. Thanks for making a confusing issue a little less confusing, but still confusing. Fuzzy math, I guess that's where it was invented, right? Yeah. It's just inherent, I guess. Yeah. All right. City Manager, you have the next two presentations. And yep. Mayor, um, I, I might suggest that this tapestry report isn't time sensitive and we've taken quite a bit of time already. Um, we can put that off. And in addition, I wanted to have some materials to project and the <coughs> computer got infected and I couldn't prepare anything. So uh, if the council will allow, we can defer that to a later meeting. Sure. I, uh, I did read the, uh, you, you sent this material to us in an email and I did look through it and it, it, to me it was a it was a good point of interest which is why I asked yeah. that this be shared um, it, it does tell us a lot about ourselves yeah and that's why I thought a, a little presentation for the audience and the public might be sure. worthwhile and I I don't have that tonight okay uh, the the other item is that uh, council's request uh, discussion of planning department reorganization um, I, I handed out or passed out with the agenda a proposed structure. I don't know if you've had time to to look at that. Uh, certainly it's gonna deserve a lot more discussion and this is just presented as a starting point. It's largely along the lines of what I presented during the budget process. Um, so whatever the council would like to do with that item, we can uh, explore that tonight, uh, bring it back. I'd like to, personally, I'd like to hold it off. And sure, that's fine. Week or two. One, one, other, one other option that I'd like to have you uh, submit to the rest of the council, Doug, is at budget time, I uh, presented to, they have uh, three department heads uh, combined into the assistant city manager's position. I'd like to have that um, submitted to councils for further review, because I, I thought at the time we could have more discussion on it, but 
Um, budget took up a lot of talk at that time, and um, we weren't able to spend any time on that. But um, I'd like to have that as one of the options. Well, we had um, Superintendent of Engineering, Director of Planning, and Director of Municipal Utilities uh, combined into the Assistant City Manager's position. Okay. I have your materials from the sure. budget session. I'll yeah. work that one up. Thank you. Is that agreeable with council then to hold both of those items? Sure, yes. that's fine. Yes. Uh, councilors, do you have anything under other business? Councilor Camardo? I just have a few things. I know the last couple of weeks we've been talking and um, we've been on a lot of different issues. We've been very busy here and for, unfortunately, that's good that we move along with a lot of the um, things that come in front of council. But um, we talk about the recap every week and I think it's important that a lot of things that we've talked about the last few weeks have attention brought back to them because I think it's important that we start to put finalization to some of these issues and, and we haven't done that unfortunately. Um, one thing is, um, Doug, I know we talked about the water contract, especially with the um, town of Aurelius that uh, we have some closure on that or I know you had negotiations going on with them. Also um, a follow up with the uh, talks with the county, we had a meeting, um, what a month, month and a half ago, I think it's we, that we should have another meeting with them. Um, to further the talks that we had with shared services, um, sales tax, and different uh, thoughts that came to the table. Um, we also talked to about uh, sewer contracts. I think it's um, it was important at the time that we start talking to the towns. There might be some interest with the towns that we as a municipality could go out and take over some of the um, uh, the uh, sewer systems in the outlying towns. We have the sewage treatment plant, we have the personnel to do that. I think that we should be exploring in those areas. I know town of um, Owasco and Fleming were both amenable to have further talks in those areas so that um, I think that's important that we keep those talks going. Um, brownfields, I think it's important that that's brought back to us. I know that there was um, some questions on what was going on with the Donna McCarthy site. Um, I'd like to see some further update on that. Um, John, we were talking about updating the code with the nuisance laws. I want to make sure that that's brought back to us at some stage of the game that we're involved in that with the nuisance laws with the commercial properties, the residential areas that we we're going to have further talks. Uh, one one revision to that is on your next agenda. For okay. Uh, okay. I didn't know that, but thank you. Um, also, the budget updates. Uh, we're waiting for last year figures on the budget updates, for which we all requested. I know you gave us a lot of information on that, and um, I'd like to also see us continue talks with uh, with the unions to look at cost saving uh, opportunities that may be coming up for us to continue talks with them. Um, our budget process is right around the corner, and. We're going to be um, facing another tough year, but I, I'd like to see us continue those uh, to reach out to the unions and continue talking to them if possible. So I just like to make sure that we're following up on some of these things that we have to stay on top of them because they're all important issues. And, and as uh, Doug, I uh, have to add again, as as an additional follow-on, uh, is this certificate of need? We've been talking about it for quite some time, and I'd like to put some kind of. Uh, uh, deadline on a, on, a, on a decision for that. Um, we need to, to, you know, in my opinion, uh, so that you're not signing paperwork that, uh, you know, could at risk putting you in, uh, in prison or <laughs> whatever if somebody uh, messes up uh, that, <laughs> that we, uh, you know, let's do what we can to, to, to put that responsibility where it lies. Uh, I know you're a bit uncomfortable signing them, as would anybody else in that same position. Uh, so I, I would like to see something uh, done. Like I said, we talked about transferring the certificate of need with a with a performance uh, clawback provision. Uh, not that the, your, the ambulance service is doing anything wrong right now, but just to safeguard our, our uh, ability to, uh, to to rake that back in. Anything else, Council? Recap? You don't have to go through it. <laughs> he really covered it all. Yeah. I, what he said. Uh, what <laughs> council, I've got everything down. I did. Okay, good. Thank you. And Mr. Rizika. Okay. Uh, do we have a request for executive session? Uh, yes, Your Honor. We have uh, uh, to discuss uh, contractual matters related to the uh, landfill gas facility. Very good. Sponsor. Uh, Councilor Camardo, second by Councilor Rainey. 
to uh, call the roll in regards to executive session. I will. Councilor Grady? Yes. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Smith? Aye. Councilor Rizika? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. We'll be in recess for executive session.